Good afternoon, and welcome to my talk on Poisson surface reconstruction with envelope constraints. In this talk, I will describe work done with Ming Chuang, Simon Rusinkevich, and Hughes Hoppe. Surface reconstruction has been a well-studied problem for several decades. In general, the problem can be stated as follows. Given a set of input point samples, reconstruct a surface that passes through or near the points. In this talk, we will consider an extended version of this problem. Consider the case that we are given not only a set of input samples, but also an envelope within which we know the reconstructed surface must lie. Our goal is to reconstruct a surface that passes through or near the samples and is contained within the envelope. To motivate this problem, let's consider how the input to the reconstruction process is obtained. Typically, we have a model that is imaged from multiple directions using a calibrated depth camera. Each depth map can be used to generate a subset of the input points. In addition, since each depth map is sampled on a regular grid, local neighborhood information can be used to estimate properties like surface normals, allowing us to obtain a sampling of the oriented points from the surface. Using the calibration information, these oriented points can be brought into a consistent coordinate frame, generating a consolidated point set. Unfortunately, the object itself may have complex geometry and physical constraints may make it impossible to image all parts of the surface. This results in a point cloud that undersamples the surface, which in turn results in poor surface reconstruction, with the surface often ballooning out in regions of missing data. To address this problem, we leverage an observation made by Curlis and Lavoie in their implementation of VRIP. When we have data coming from range scans, we not only know where we would like the surface to be, we also know where it cannot be. For example, computing the generalized cone, leaving the camera's pinhole and going through the silhouette of a depth map, one obtains a visual hull which must contain the true surface. Assuming that the surface is opaque, one can further carve out the line segments between the camera's pinhole and the range scan to obtain the depth hull. Computing the intersections of these hulls gives an envelope that can be used to constrain where the reconstructed surface must lie. In our work, we aim to incorporate the envelope constraints within an existing surface reconstruction approach. While there are many existing approaches, one that has proven to be particularly effective is implicit surface reconstruction. This approach first fits a 3D function to the input point set, and then extracts the reconstructed surface as a level set of that function. In general, implicit surface reconstruction approaches fit either a sign distance function to the points or an indicator function. The former is the function giving the distance from a point in 3D to the nearest point on the surface, with points in the interior assigned a negative value and points in the exterior assigned a positive value. The reconstructed surface is then the zero level set of this function. The latter is a smooth version of the function with value one inside the surface and value zero outside. The reconstructed surface is then the 0.5 level set. A natural question to consider then is, which implicit function should we use if we want to support envelope constraints? One way to answer this is to think about what values we expect the implicit function to have outside the envelope. In the case of the sine distance function, this is a hard question to answer, since the values of the sine distance function on the envelope depend on the position of points on the reconstructed surface, which are only known once the reconstruction problem has been solved. This creates a chicken and egg scenario. In the case of the indicator function, things are substantially simpler. Since we know that the envelope is outside the surface, it follows that the value of the implicit function at points outside the envelope has to be uniformly zero. This leads to a very simple but very powerful observation. If we can impose Dirichlet boundary constraints, forcing the implicit function to be zero everywhere outside the envelope, we automatically produce an implicit function whose 0.5 level set is interior to the envelope. So now the question becomes, how do we force the implicit function to be zero outside the envelope? To answer this question, we briefly review the way in which Poisson reconstruction, a standard approach for fitting an indicator function to input point samples, represents and solves for the implicit function. To discretize the implicit function, a finite function basis is chosen, and the implicit function is represented as a linear combination of these basis functions. For example, one can use the piecewise linear hat functions centered at the vertices of a regular grid. To support a hierarchical solver, function bases are defined at different resolutions. For example, one can use hat functions centered at the vertices of progressively coarser grids. The key to transitioning between the different levels of the multi-resolution hierarchy efficiently is that the basis functions nest. That is, 
Coarser basis functions can be expressed as linear combinations of finer ones. For example, using the hat basis, a function at one level of the hierarchy can be expressed as a linear combination of three functions at the next finer level. To make the complexity of the approach linear in the size of the input, the basis functions are defined over an octree that is adapted to the input points, providing the high resolution needed to resolve geometric detail without overwhelming memory and compute resources by introducing degrees of freedom where they are not needed. Putting this together, the Poisson surface reconstruction algorithm essentially reduces to the solution of a linear system, where we seek the indicator function chi, whose Laplacian is equal to the divergence of a vector field n. The vector field n is defined by the normals of the input points and is only non-zero in the vicinity of the points. Using the hierarchy, the system is solved in a coarse-defined manner, where at each level we estimate the residual constraints that have not been met yet and refine the solution using an iterative solver like Gauss-Seidel relaxation. We note that to compute the residual constraints at a given level, we need to integrate the divergence of n against the basis functions defined at that level, a point we'll come back to later. Now, let's revisit the question of how to impose Dirichlet constraints, forcing the computed indicator function to be zero outside the envelope, or equivalently, forcing the computed indicator function to be supported within the envelope. The easiest way to ensure that the function we construct is supported inside the envelope is to remove every basis function whose support overlaps the exterior of the envelope. The remaining functions will then all be supported in the envelope, as will any linear combination of these functions. For example, if the red region denotes the exterior, we would remove the two leftmost and two rightmost functions. This would certainly ensure that any implicit function we construct using the remaining functions would be zero outside the envelope. However, at coarser resolutions, where the functions have wider support, we'd be removing too many functions. In particular, this would imply that the solution obtained at lower resolutions of our multigrid solver would likely be a poor initial guess for the true solution. An alternate approach is to reshape the coarser resolution basis functions so that they are supported inside the envelope. That is to express each coarser basis function as a linear combination of finer functions that are themselves supported within the envelope. Assume we have removed all finest level basis functions whose support overlaps the exterior of the envelope. Now consider the leftmost basis function at the next level of the hierarchy. Using a regular multigrid system, it would be expressed as a weighted sum of three basis functions at the finest level. However, in our system, all three functions are zero. The first never existed because its support did not overlap the function's domain, and the other two were removed because their support overlapped the exterior of the envelope. Expressing the coarser basis function as the linear combination of these three functions, we get the zero function, which is certainly supported in the interior of the envelope. Considering the next basis function, we again express it as a linear combination of three finer functions. In this case, one of the finer functions was removed, but the other two were kept. This gives us a reshaped function that is supported in the interior of the envelope. Moving on to the next function, all three finer functions are kept, and the coarser function is unchanged. Continuing on, the second function from the right is reshaped, and the rightmost function becomes zero. At the third level of the hierarchy, using a regular multigrid system, the leftmost function would be the linear combination of three functions from the second level. The first is zero because its support did not overlap the function's domain, the second was reshaped to zero, and the third was reshaped so it would be supported within the envelope. So, expressing the coarser basis function as a linear combination of these three functions, we get a scaled multiple of the second function from the second level. The next function is a linear combination of two reshaped functions and one standard hat basis function from the second level. And the last basis function is, again, a scaled multiple of a reshaped function from the second level. In terms of the implementation, it is reasonably straightforward to do the reshaping when the functions are defined over a regular grid. So in our implementation, we make the grid regular up to some predefined depth and adapt the tree to the input samples beyond that. Then we reshape the basis functions at the regular levels and remove basis functions at the adapted levels. The last issue we consider is how well the solver behaves when we remove basis functions from the adapted levels of the octree. To understand the problem, let's recall what happens when using a regular grid. If, for some reason, we fail to get a good initial guess at coarser resolutions, this is unfortunate, of course, 
but we can always recover by performing more Gauss-Seidel relaxations at the finer levels. This issue is more pronounced when using an adaptive solver. In regions where the grid is not refined, we do not have finer basis functions, and so we cannot correct the initial guess obtained from the course of resolutions. So, at the very least, to implement an effective solver, we have to make sure that when defining the linear system, we provide a good representation of the divergence of n to the course of resolutions. Recall that when solving the Poisson equation to compute the indicator function, we define the right-hand side of the system by integrating the divergence of n against the different basis functions. If, at a coarser level, we remove basis functions whose support overlaps the divergence of n, we would get an incomplete representation of the divergence at that level. This would imply that we solve the wrong problem at coarser levels, which, because we're using an adapted octree, would mean that we get a bad solution where the octree is not refined. An example can be seen on the right where we show points at an envelope obtained from a horse contour on the top and the reconstructed implicit function on the bottom. The implicit function is drawn using red for pixels at which the function is equal to zero and ranges from black to white as the function goes from zero to one. As we see, the obtained function satisfies the Dirichlet constraints with a value of zero outside the envelope. However, at coarser resolutions, the linear system sees a dampened version of the divergence producing a dampened indicator function. This is corrected near the input samples, where the tree is refined, but the obtained function has a value substantially smaller than one, the expected value of the indicator function, in the interior of the horse. We address this problem by simply not removing basis functions whose support overlaps the divergence of n, ensuring that we can correctly represent the divergence at coarser levels. This effectively erodes the region where Dirichlet constraints are imposed, as can be seen from the way in which the red region retracts from the boundary of the horse. Because we provide a better representation of the divergence, we get a better initial guess at coarser resolutions, which, in turn, produces an implicit function that more closely resembles the indicator function of the horse. Now let's take a look at some results. We begin by considering idealized data where we virtually scan known geometry from different positions on the view sphere. For example, we scanned a skeletal torso from 12 different positions, obtaining 12 different depth maps. As the skeleton's torso has high depth complexity, there are many points on the surface that are not seen from any of the 12 virtual cameras. As a result, standard Poisson reconstruction produces spurious surfaces incorrectly connecting the different ribs. Adding the depth hull extracted from the scans and running our constrained Poisson reconstruction, we obtain an improved reconstruction without spurious surfaces. Additionally, as we are working with virtual data and the ground truth solution is known, we can empirically validate the improvement by measuring the distance between the reconstructed surface and the input virtual model. In this case, we find that incorporating the envelope reduces the error by a factor of two. We also compare our proposed approach to other possible solutions. For these experiments, we virtually scan the stool model using three different positions on the view sphere. As with the torso, incorporating the envelope provides a better solution, which is closer to the original model. An alternate solution would be to run the standard reconstruction, but only keep the part of the reconstructed surface that is close to the input samples. This has the disadvantage of producing a surface with boundary and requiring parameter tuning to define how close to the samples the surface needs to be in order to be preserved. Empirically, we also find that this produces lower quality reconstructions. We could also run the standard reconstruction and then remove the part of the surface outside the envelope. Again, this can produce surfaces with boundaries and it only works well if the envelope tightly surrounds the surface. As before, we find that this crop reconstruction is lower quality than the result obtained incorporating the envelope as a Dirichlet constraint. A third approach would be to compute the implicit function using the standard reconstruction, zero out the function in regions outside the envelope, and only then extract the 0.5 level set. This approach is guaranteed to produce a watertight surface. However, as before, it requires an envelope that tightly surrounds the true surface. And, as with other forms of clipping, this produces lower quality reconstructions. We also consider real world data by using the big bird datasets generously provided by Singital. These datasets are obtained by placing various objects on a turntable, rotating the turntable at three degree increments, and imaging each rotated model using five calibrated color in depth cameras. In addition to the camera calibration information, the data for each object consists of color images, depth images, and segmentation masks. 
The data set is challenging for all the reasons real world data is hard. The acquisition process is noisy. The calibration information is imperfect so scans can be misaligned. And the sampling density depends on the way in which the surface normals align with the camera's forward direction. Additionally, since the objects are placed on a turntable and the five cameras are situated on the upper hemisphere looking down on the turntable, there are no scans seeing the underside of the models. As an example, here are point clouds and associated depth hulls obtained from two models in the Big Bird dataset. The top row shows the detergent model, the bottom row shows the paper cup holder. Using Poisson reconstruction without envelope constraints, we obtain surfaces that balloon out at the bottom where there are no samples. For the detergent model, we use a standard implementation with Neumann boundary conditions on the surface of the bounding cube. Since this does not constrain the values of the computed implicit function, the 0.5 level set can exit the bounding cube and we obtain a surface with boundary. For the paper cup holder, we use Dirichlet constraints on the surface of the bounding cube. This ensures that the implicit function is contained entirely within the cube, but does not otherwise provide a meaningful constraint. Constraining the reconstruction to lie within the depth hulls, we obtain surfaces that are indistinguishable from those produced by standard Poisson reconstruction in regions seen by the scanner, and which reasonably complete the surface in regions of missing data. We can also compare the runtime of the reconstruction process with and without the use of envelope constraints. The table provides statistics about the input to the reconstruction process, including the number of points and the number of triangles on the envelope. It also gives the running time for reconstructing using octrees at different depths without using envelope constraints. Incorporating the envelope constraints, we see only a small increase in the total running time. To conclude, our work starts by borrowing from Curlis and Lavoy using the fact that commonly available scanner data provides information not only about where the surface is, but also where it cannot be. We observe that if we formulate surface reconstruction as a problem of fitting an indicator function to the input samples, then incorporating envelope information becomes a matter of supporting Dirichlet boundary constraints. And finally, we have seen that incorporating the envelope constraints produces significantly improved reconstructions with only a marginal increase in running time. In the future, we would like to consider two different extensions of our work. First, we would like to modify our implementation to use reshaping at all levels of the octree, not just the fully regular levels. This would allow us to define higher resolution Dirichlet boundary constraints and would allow us to avoid using erosion to obtain a good initial guess at coarser resolutions. Additionally, Earlier work has demonstrated the advantage of using an adaptive octree for applications in fluid simulations. In that context, Dirichlet constraints play an important role in describing the interfaces between the fluid and its surrounding, and we would like to explore possible applications of our solver to these problems. Thank you very much for your attention.